Event freelancers, welcome to your new community. Connecting you to your next project. Get connected. Sign up now. It's free. So, hello and welcome to session five. How do companies manage their freelancers? In this session, we're going to offer you the chance to hear from some of the biggest and best agencies around the world, uh, agencies who are always looking for freelance talent, uh, freelancers who can work with their internal teams, work with their clients, and of course, uh, be equipped and experienced enough to deal with the project challenges that are about to come. Every agency in the world is always looking for that unique freelancer that's going to help them win the pitch, deliver the project, and even come back and help them keep the client uh, for longer. Uh, of course, that's if you're available, that's uh, if you're not already working for their competitors, and it makes for a very interesting uh, uh, relationship, shall we say. I know that from my own experience that it can often feel like a revolving door. Um, I'm often connected to one or two individuals within the agency, uh, and it's often difficult to understand the size and scale of an organization when certainly the agencies we're about to talk to today uh, are global in their reach with multiple offices around, around the world. So let me introduce you to an amazing panel of speakers, uh, each of them with uh, huge credentials. Uh, if you don't know them already, I highly recommend you get to know them. Um, but first up, uh, Dawn Dennis, Operations Director, freelance, living in uh, Hong Kong. Um, she's been in Asia for many, many years. Adrian Bell, Founder and Executive Director of Action Impact in Dubai. Chris McDonald, Operations Director here in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, recently completed a 11-year stint at Jack Morton. Uh, and finally, Mark Iacono, General Manager of GPJ Australia in Sydney. So we have such little time and so much to talk about. Thank you very, very much for your time uh, for the summit today. Uh, but let's kick off. Um, Dawn, um, how do agencies manage their freelancers? What do they do to attract talent, keep talent and nurture them? Uh, I think in terms of keeping track, it can be quite haphazard. Uh, it's very reliant on the black books of the individuals that are on your team. Uh, we did try at times, um, I'm, by the way, I'm speaking from experience of spending four years as director of operations at Uniplan, uh, another large agency within Hong Kong, and also has global offices, but so that experience comes from there. Uh, we had an Excel spreadsheet for a while. We even tried to make comments. We tried to have things, but that gets buried on the server in some unknown location. And sometimes when you have the revolving doors, that can also get, again, get lost in the, in the muck. Um, so very often it's, I have an urgent need for an urgent, for this particular skill. Who knows a guy that knows this? And it's just, you go around the office and somebody makes a call and it comes in. And uh, a lot of time you as an agency are, going through event after event after event and you get you get you don't have the time you'd like to keep track of what was the feedback of that person um you know how did they do was that a well suited to them so there's from my experience there's there hasn't been uh one good way to kind of keep all that straight and it was just very reliant on the people that you had in house at the time it may, may, maybe that reflects on my own experience on the other side of the door then uh, but yeah. Adrian, um, how is it in the Middle East? Well, I won't be as eloquent as uh, as, as Dawn because the answer is uh, uh, badly is is how we most of us manage our relationships with freelancers. You know, our source of great talent, of discovering other talent, that the best and most proven channel is through other great talent. You know, the old adage of uh, birds of a feather, so to speak. Um, so we discover great production managers, great creative directors, great producers through other great talent that's worked for us. So the most powerful recommendation network is is people you're already working with. Um, but but to add to Dawn's point, you know, it is a mishmash of uh, of black books, dodgy Excel spreadsheets, Outlook calendars, and God knows what. So uh, I think for and on behalf of the entire industry, the answer is badly. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm about to pass that question to Chris because um, I think we all know around the table that Jack Morton have been and continue to be a standard out there. 
uh, have systems in place. But Chris, tell me a little bit about your experience. Well, it's been a combination of all, from both John and Adrian as well. It is a bit of a you know, um, referral basis based on who you know and who you've got in house. Um, but also, I think leveraging off the you know the talent pool that was available globally as well, and just and within your own network, um, utilizing also kind of the more the freelancers on that more contract basis as well. I think that's a key thing that Jax I think definitely does. They bring in a lot of um, people with a long term vision. Um, I know that's kind of on the, on the broad end and trained up as it were on a longer term basis, um, particularly from a contract perspective. And that does certainly help. Um, yeah, in terms of, but it, it is just a mix of that. It is still a mix of finding the right people through your networks and who's available within the teams. And Mark, Australia, what is the market like um, down under? Uh, thanks, AJ. Um, Look, you know, we, we've had a, a few different ways of, uh, of, of getting to our contractors, but actually um, I, I will um, I just touch on something uh, Chris has said, and that is that actually one of the terms in Australia that actually became, um, it still lives with our language is, uh, um, is what they call a permalancer. Um, and it's a great, it's a great word. And, it, and it, it kind of, it talks to so many different things within our industry, especially and some of the things that um, uh, having been at, at actually at Jack's for six years and now, um, at George P. Johnson for at least three now. Um, it's something that um, is really, really important to us. You know, one of the ways that we really attract a lot of the best talent um, is not by paying them over the odds necessarily. Um, yes, they get paid well, but, um, and, um, you know, but we, we don't have to throw buckets and buckets of money at them. But actually one of the things that I think we're actually really good at is, is giving them some really good culture, but also um, not looking for you know that sort of one week or two week contract, but actually helping them to get uh, a long term supply of work. So really, when we're talking to a freelancer or a contractor, we're looking for a person to go. You know what? I can hold on to this person for three, six, twelve, eighteen months, uh, and actually move them around the business and 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 really utilize them and really make them part of a team. And and uh, and if that's something they want, then not all of them want that. Some of them want to sort of um, you know kind of give and go, but. Um, you know, certainly that's one of the things that we look at. Um, the business here in Australia and New Zealand, we've expanded out into New Zealand, has literally doubled in the last three years. So we've gone now to a $110 million business, um, 140 staff at least. Um, we've run out of black books, let's be really honest. Um, so, you know, when um, I first met AJ, um, uh, would be a good year, a year ago, um, when he told me about Connected, it was a great, um, for me, it was a great, uh, melding. Um, it was a melding of, I guess, you know, what, what was being created in Australia, which were some Facebook um, sites that talked about, talked to, talked to the people who were in the, in the industry, but you couldn't really get to get any really deep knowledge of them. And you certainly couldn't see whether they were available or not, um, or what their skill sets were. And I think um, AJ and Steve and the team at Connected have done a really, really good job to meld all those in a tool that, um, to be honest, even I can use. So um, thanks, AJ. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the plug, Mark. But maybe a question back to Chris and Mark. Uh, in that talent pool, when you do find people on the referrals that even Adrian was suggesting, how much of that is collaboration across offices? Uh, because I know that freelancers are uh, difficult creatures at times, and maybe they don't want the three months, six months. They are also looking for that next unique challenge. But how much, how much do you share as, as operations structures, as heads of departments? I think from the tax perspective, we definitely do share um, within the network and with, within the region as well. I think particularly here in, in Asia, I mean, I was working with Dan and, and Margot quite a, quite a fair bit in, in Sydney and Singapore. And, you know, it's totally crucial to make it all work, um, particularly when you're working on different um, projects and needing to kind of spread the love as it were, because some parts of the business are busier than others. For, for example, in Australia, um, this time of year may be quieter or present in Asia may be busier and vice versa in, in other markets. Um, and also I think part of that as well is just um, allowing people to have a bit of growth as well and kind of go and experience other offices in other cultures, you know. Um, it's a huge thing, particularly here in Asia, you know, if you're based in Singapore, for example, you want to try being in Hong Kong or China, it certainly, or Australia it certainly helps. Um, and that's been a, quite a useful um, attraction or a carrot as it were for freelancers to actually become part of the, of the team um, by, by allowing that. 
uh, movement within the offices. It's, I would say it's probably more regional. It's probably the same in, in, in Europe and the US right. as well. Um, and in the US particularly, it's really, it's everyone's all over the place um, in terms of patients, but they do come together on all different projects with these two West Coast quite well. And something, Adrian, that you suggested, I, I, my experience with the Middle East is that, again, maybe in relation to what Mark said, is that each country seems to have its own legislative or regulations in how freelancers can or can't operate. Tell me a little bit about the Middle East in that context. Well, with, with the Middle East, um, you, you know, it is now perfectly viable and possible and legal for that matter to, uh, to um, incorporate essentially as an independent freelancer and exist here. The, the challenge for many freelancers here is it's, it's incredibly seasonal. So, you know, our, our season at best is quite a binary eight months, four months. So eight months in a good year of a season uh, and then four months, almost darkness. And that for, for any aspiring freelancer, no matter how good, uh, how experienced you are, is very, very difficult to deal with 12 months of the year. So parachuting, parachuting talent in is something we do very regularly, but equally we have the permalancer model as well. So we have... We have free full-time freelancers, uh, you know, almost FTEs, so to speak, um, uh, with us. So we, we operate that sort of hybrid model between both. We'll parachute in for short-term projects and we will uh, recruit for longer-term, you know, sort of baseline staffing as well. Um, I know that Dawn brought up the Excel spreadsheet uh, process and procedure for managing but tell me a little bit about some of the real challenges and the revolving door, and maybe even some of the red lines that exist between agencies and freelancers. Um, I, know, uh, I want to refer to the fact that, you know, sometimes clients make their own demands on who you could or should work with. I wondered if you could just uh, expand a little bit on that, Dawn, from your experience. Um. The Excel spreadsheet, and even uh, actually, I forgot the ever useful uh, contact list from that event long ago. Uh, so you're thinking through job files for those as uh, to see who worked on that of a similar nature of event. Um, I mean, it's it's in general, it's just it's kind of a mess because again, typically agencies are running you know 150 percent capacity, and you don't have time from an operations director or the producers to update this mystical uh spreadsheet um so it just it, it it definitely is challenging and then again if you do have um a revolving of staff often enough then you just you lose those contacts um one thing about clients and the ch way they challenge i i don't have so much re uh, request of clients for a specific person that they want on the event um of course that might be I mean, we try to do that if, if the same person ran that same event for them last year, we might use that as our advantage. But I don't um, necessarily, because of the pitch process, we don't often get a requirement that you have to hire this person or that person. Um, but another challenge that clients present, if you're not in a position to be able to have, or if you're, if you're coming from a company that um, doesn't want to take the risk of having so many permalancers, and so they don't book freelancers for extended periods of time, you're often keeping a lot of people on the lurch, you know, put that in your calendar, but don't, you know, but give me first right of refusal, but, but, uh, and then you have to cancel because you didn't win that, or you're trying to, there's always this, you're trying to hold people, but you don't want to restrict them from opportunity. But then again, you pitched with that person on the, on the, the team chart. So the nature of the pitch process and the late confirmations or the ongoing rounds of pitching, and it just drags on and, from a freelancer perspective, which I've been for the last, you know, uh, two something, two and something years, as well as most of my career, it's really frustrating to keep having someone put you on hold and then how's that going? How's that going? And then it disappears. Or it's we need you to work on Monday and it's Friday. Uh, so that's a, a, a challenge that I would have from an operations director, director with sympathy towards my freelancers, or just trying to keep up my credibility with freelancers when I'm asking them to put their put the calendars on hold. Um, or as a freelancer in the other direction. So uh, I think that's one of the major I think, challenges. I think one of, the, one of the things you're also alluding to there is that that is un unfortunately a, um, an output of the way the whole ecosystem works. It is yeah. lastminute.com by nature. 
Um, and this is also where maybe the relationship between a freelancer and an agency is also uh, akin to the relationship between an agency and their client, where actually things are just never signed up. The purchase order's not arrived. Uh, and actually somebody else is sitting available on the side of a, a, a room that you may as well use as well at the time. So. And it's also state of the industry reflective because um, anyway, I'll, I'll speak for Hong Kong and I'll speak for like from last year to before, because right now, of course, we're in a unique situation, but the volatility, the, the, the urgency that clients come to us with events, if an agency isn't in a position to book someone for three to six months um, and have that reliable, good talent pool in-house, in-house already, um, the clients make it, or the, the nature of the business coming in the door makes it really hard uh, to book people uh, for lengths of time. So let me move the conversation on a little bit. We've got 12, 15 minutes left, but what are the strategic changes that you are all having to make that you know agencies are gonna to have to make? And this is all very much post COVID. Um, we know that you can't get on planes anymore. We know about these lockdowns that are wave one, wave two, wave three, whatever they will be in the future. Um, what, what strategic changes are you making in, uh, within your organization? Maybe I can, Talk to Adrian first on that. So. Well, uh, the most obvious change of all is, you know, widening our net of talent, um, uh, broadening our access and relationships with independent talent, because we, like most other agencies, have had to, you know, scale back our full-time in-house employees and thus broaden our uh, access to independent talent. So that's all about relationship development. But uh, curiously, it feels like one-way traffic at the moment. Um, it's, it's more us reaching out than others reaching in, so to speak. So that, that's one of the uh, the biggest changes uh, for us, I think, in the in the immediate in the immediate future. Yeah. And and how are you doing that in a global world? I mean, are you literally you refer to the fact that there's referrals through people you already know, but if you needed a little community in Brazil, in Manchester, in Munich. Um, are you literally now investing time in creating those little bubbles and communities of people? Yeah, so it's it's the usual channels of familiarity. So trusted producers that work with us and creators, we're looking for re constant referrals. Um, that the power of our own networks on and connections via LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a platform our team use very very regularly. Um, but my goodness, you know that the reach is is often in the same place. And yeah, being British owned company, we're exploring the same markets we always have explored, but I'd love to un, un, unlock talent in in Germany or in France or in Spain, but we just, those are borders at the moment that are difficult to break with the tools that we have. And is there a, is there an element of language in there as well? Uh, we are all English speaking. Is there an element of having to now find talent in other languages because post COVID maybe you're not your clients are going to want you to do events in those countries, but you really ain't going to be able to send your A team or the team that you had in mind originally for it. Yeah, like language is, 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 is always an issue, but uh, you know, being a predominantly English speaking organization, even though I think our agency at the last count is 19 different languages, which is perfectly normal for a, an agency in the Middle East, but we're all speaking, we're all speaking English. So, as long as the baseline of English is is good, uh, yes. I actually don't care whether they're Spanish, French, German, or or Japanese. It doesn't matter as long as they can communicate in English. Then then there's no issue with. Uh, uh, I, suppose I, I suppose that reflects on your clients and the business. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. The language of business is English as well. But Chris, what about what's your experience of that? Particularly, I know for Asia, it's such a diaspora of countries and locations and people and. It, Often you can sit in a room and there's already 19 languages in front of you. But what's your experience there? I think the key challenge will be kind of finding the right people, the right place, um, and also the right um, um, you know, that, um, language base as well, particularly here in Asia. You know, particularly it's trilingual obligations here in Asia. I think, you know, in, particularly in Hong Kong, Chinese, mm -hmm. Cantonese, and English. Um, mm -hmm. So those. Those, uh, those kind of prerequisites come in as well, rather than just one language of English. I think these other key languages, particularly here in Hong Kong and China, is, is, a, is 
it, it really narrows down the playing field even more. Um, and I think that's going to be uh, tough here, I guess. Um, how, do, how, again, how, do, how do, and I'll just speak for Asia specifically, but you know, how do you raise the skill sets of everybody as well when they are all coming from different cultural backgrounds? Many not from a theatre. I think we would all recognise theatre as a as a certain standard and as an entry point. But how how are agencies going to lift that game? Because it's easy to get a name of somebody somewhere, but you really don't know until the day it matters whether they're actually skilled at the job. How how are agencies going to manage that? Well, I think the way Jack does it is kind of you know kind of um, a solid induction, or at least kind of taking them in and kind of giving them a proper induction as to this is how we're doing it. This is the process. This is the documentation that is acquired. This is what we use and the language we use. I think that's that's quite a, a strong trait at Jack. And I think and you know you almost have to become that person and become and live that brand. You know within you know um, to kind of um, work within the agency. So do you do you have do you have open days or is it just an online induction process? It's pretty much um, when they come in, you can kind of take them through this. Oh, God, this is who you are. This is what you're doing. And all the expectations, and this is what tools you've got to play with. Yeah. I think coming moving forward, I think it will be kind of looking at online inductions and training processes and everything else. Um, definitely. And Mark, what about Australia? I mean, you've already touched on the fact that you refer to your permalances and contractors as opposed to direct freelancers, but clearly you're investing time in um, yeah. time and money in freelancers as well, it seems. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. That's right. Um, I just uh, want to touch on something actually Adrian said, um, uh, particularly if you're a freelancer listening to this. Um, it's it's amazing. I think the, the whilst everything is a little crazy at the moment, but you know, if we talk, you know, post COVID for a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, you know, agencies um, as well as our clients are not going to be hiring full-time staff. <laughs> They're going to be looking um, for freelancers, contractors, uh, agencies will, going to be, will, will be doing the same. So in fact, the, the, up, um, the, the uptake of, of freelancers and contractors um, as, the, as the economies um, begin to start moving again will be, will be massive. And, and I can't see that changing for um, some months to, to come, to be really honest. Um, so it's, it's a good time to, to get in there, to, you know, uh, come to people like, you know, in the, in the larger agencies, you have the head of productions, you've got the uh, director of productions, you've got certain roles that, you know, you should be targeting and talking to um, and making sure that you're, you're connected to them either in a connected in the, in the real uh, online tool or, or in a face-to-face -face kind of um, environment. So, you know, don't, don't let that, um, don't let that opportunity uh, go by. Um, we invest a, a lot of money, uh, GPJ, and particularly um, Australia, New Zealand, and, and this is now being spread um, not only uh, regionally but but globally um, in, in some of the training and induction tools. We've realised that you know it's great to have the best freelancer or contractor or whatever it is for a, for a job, but if they're not operating as part of the team in the same way that we work, in the same processes and booking talent or booking whatever they need to do or doing what they need to do in our agency, um, they become the worst person in the business and, and they become the weak link, even though they might have a lot of other skills. So uh, we now have um, a, a pretty much fully fledged, um, not only induction, um, but also uh, an internal training. Uh, I think AJ, you touched earlier, you know, how, you know, everyone's looking for broadcast producers at the moment. Everyone's looking for that sort of theater um, skill sets and so forth. You know, we, we now have, uh, I guess, a, a uh, a, a content bank of not necessarily that exact skill or that training module, um, but a lot of the modules and trainings that, that we do want our staff to have. So, um, you know, not only are we building within for the full time staff, but actually bringing in the right people to to do the job um, uh, post COVID as well. Uh, and, you know, uh, dare I say, um, there are some people sitting at home with not much to do. You know, here in Australia, we've got the job keeper, which is the, you know, the Australian government's way of, of, of kind of keeping the economy ticking along. Um, and, and they're using that time to, to, to look at those training, look at that training, uh, those training videos or manuals um, and, and getting across and upskilling themselves um, as well. So it's a good opportunity to do that. You've, you've given me a perfect cue into one of my final questions, really. But actually, before... What, do, what should freelancers do before they even contact you? 
Um, you know, they, they, there's clearly a call out. Clearly, the winners post COVID, if I can put it that way, are going to be the freelancers because there's going to be a huge supply and demand for that. But what should they be doing before they even pick up the phone and talk to you? Um, well, I think that it's it's the old tricks really, which is uh, find a connection, uh, personalize your approach. Yeah. Uh, please don't make it look obvious that your approach, if it's in writing, is just cut and paste from the other 50 emails you've just sent. Uh, please make sure your, your LinkedIn page and or your CV is up to date. Uh, it's, all the, it's all the housekeeping you should be doing and just have a bit of an edge, a bit of a relationship, a bit of an in, uh, some sort of connection. Or if you don't have any of that, uh, you know, some sort of interest in, in the work we're doing. It's relevant. It's up to date. But otherwise, you know, you've just got to think that uh, post COVID, so to speak, as we emerge into the new normal, we are, I hope, going to be overwhelmed with incoming traffic of people looking for work. So you've got to get through that initial 30 second filter as well. Yeah. And what about you, Chris? You must see you must have seen hundreds of call outs and emails and CVs. What should they be doing better uh, before they call somebody with your caliber? Pretty much, pretty much everything Adrian was, Adrian was saying. Also, just doing a bit more homework as to what the agency has done just recently or more more recently, and if there's any connection there with the work they've done, and that you've got an interest in that, and tap into that um, as well. Mark, any any top tips from you? Uh, yeah, thanks, AJ. Um, literally, just as we were coming into uh, COVID, probably the second weekend, we actually had a, a job ad that we we put up. Um, and we got 560 applications in 48 hours. Um, right. So that will give you an, an idea of, of what's going to happen or what is happening already. Um, uh, it's, un it's really unfortunate, but uh, it, is, it is the truth at the moment. Um, my top tip would be um, find out who you know within the agency and get them. And if, and, and if you really have a connection with them, get them to, you know, go and tap up the, uh, you know, the head of production or director of production or uh, whatever that role is in a larger agency um, and, and, and get, a, get them to put in a good word for you because um, when you're up against 559 <coughs> others, um, it's going to be tough. Yeah. And Dawn, what would, yeah. what would we be saying to our Asian freelancers out here? <laughs> yeah, it's Asian, but um, I think in an overall sense, I mean, everything that Adrian, Chris, and Mark said, of course, um, the stand, find some way to stand out. But another thing that is becoming so integral to what we're doing is the understanding of our clients' brands. And so besides like what Adrian says of you, you want to talk to me, know who I am, you know what, know my company, know what we're doing. You know, so that email might start, hey, uh, Chris at Jack Morton. We, I, I noticed that you guys did the the launch for this product with that. I'm really, or I love sports and I love the Adidas brand. Um, I'd, I'd love to work on something like that. If you don't have any point of offering, maybe you're not senior enough that you're saying I'm really strong in this skill, your motivation, your attitude can also be something we're looking for as well. And, uh, and that you went that extra mile to understand us as an agency brand, but as well as the, the brands that we uh, serve uh, also will make points. Um, there's just so often when anyone in our team is in a meeting with the client and someone suggests a color that is completely off brand and it's just, oh, it's so frustrating because those clients expect every level of our team to understand them and they should, you know, I mean, that's not an unreasonable request. So having a freelancer that we need to take to the meeting, um, knowing that they know um, our brands and our clients is um, maybe almost as well as we do is appreciated and um, I think we'll put you, uh, also give you an advantage to getting some attention to the top of the resume pile. From, from all, all four of you, thank you very, very much. But certainly what I take away from it is do your homework, get your profile uh, up, up, up to date and ready and uh, be keen, be willing, get involved and find, find the right people. But listen, we have run out of time. We, as always, have so much more to talk about, but thank you very, very much. Dawn Dennis, Mark Iacono, Chris McDonald, and Adrian Bell. Thank you very, very much. And I look forward to meeting you in the uh, coffee break uh, for more networking later. But thank you.
event freelancers. Welcome to your new community, connecting you to your next project. Get connected. Sign up now. It's free.